West Side is a joyful place, and that joy is enhanced this morning by your presence, and especially by the presence of those of you who are guests today. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. Nate, thank you for leading us in our singing this morning. I especially appreciate that last song. It brings back a lot of very special memories for me, as I'm sure it does for many of you in the audience this morning. I want to recognize Joe and Sammy Lou Smith this morning, who celebrated their 51st wedding anniversary yesterday. So congratulations to Joe and Sammy Lou. I have a special appreciation for Joe and Sammy Lou. Joe has been a gospel preacher for many, many, many years. And though he's retired now from local preaching, he's still very active in carrying the gospel around the world and the preaching and teaching that he does. And he and Sammy Lou are certainly a great, great blessing to us here in this church. Back in 1860, there were two sisters, Anna Bartlett uh, Warner and her sister Susan. Both of them were Christian writers. They wrote poetry, Christian novels, children's books, and other religious literature. On one occasion, Susan Warner was writing a novel, and she asked her sister Anna to write the lyrics to a song. The novel was about a child that was seriously ill, facing death. And Susan wanted a song that could be used to provide comfort and strength to the child in her novel. And so her sister Anna composed these familiar lyrics. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That novel was released in 1860. Two years later, William Bradbury, a musical composer who had composed such well-known hymns as Just As I Am and Sweet Hour of Prayer, ran across those lyrics and set them to music. He added a chorus that consisted of just four words repeated three times. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I suppose there is no more familiar hymn in the English language than that children's song that has a very grown-up meaning. Back in 1962, a well-known Swiss theologian named Karl Barth was touring the United States on a speaking tour, and at the various stops along the way, he was asked questions by some of the leading scholars in our nation. On at least two occasions, he was asked, in all of your studies, what do you consider to be the most profound thought that you've ever run across? And on both of those occasions in Chicago and also in Richmond, Virginia, Karl Barth responded by saying the most profound thought that I've ever run across is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. As we're continuing our investigation of God this morning, we cannot neglect the subject of God's amazing love, for it is the central theme of the entire Bible. It runs like a silver cord from Genesis through the book of Revelation. God's amazing love for you and for me. I want to share two verses with you this morning with which you are extremely familiar the writer John is the only gospel writer who recorded the nighttime conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. It was in the midst of that conversation 
that Jesus made this familiar statement in John 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And then this same Apostle John would later write in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, by this is the love of God manifested to us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world to die for us so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and given his son as the propitiation for our sins. I want you to think with me this morning about the three dimensions of God's amazing love. And the first of these is that God's love for us is a demonstrated love. Demonstrated. I heard about a couple who had been married for many years. They were sitting at home one night. She was reading and he was watching television. She looked up from her book and she said to him, do you still love me? He was so engrossed in watching that television show, he didn't even respond. She said, do you still love me? Again, there was no response from him. Finally, the third time, she stood up, walked over between him and the TV, and raised her voice saying, do you still love me? He said, I told you 40 years ago I loved you, and if I change my mind, I'll tell you. Well, you know, that's not a very healthy relationship. All of us understand that in order for a relationship to be healthy, love must continually be demonstrated in a number of tangible ways, ways that can be experienced, ways that can be seen. And this is exactly what God has done. God, through the giving of his son, has expressed his love in a very tangible way. You know, one of the things that I think Satan tries to do to all of us, whether we're young or whether we're older, Satan tries to convince us that we really are not lovable. Satan tries to convince us that there is no way that God could love us. Think about it. When God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in that beautiful garden in which all of their needs were supplied. But Satan came along and he tried to do a number on Adam and Eve by convincing them that God was withholding something from them, that there was more out there, that if they would just grasp for something more, that their lives could really be fulfilled and complete. I think there are a lot of people in our society today who live with those same types of feelings, who have difficulty accepting the fact that God can love them just the way they are. How has God demonstrated his love? Well, listen, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says that in times past, God spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many different and diverse ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he has uh, 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 who has made heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. I'll get that one out there in just a moment. Now, God has demonstrated that love for us. He has what Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says is an unending love to Israel. He said, I've loved you with an unending love, a relentless love. A passion, passionate love. God says, I have drawn you to me by my loving kindness. Have you ever wondered why when God created the world and when sin entered into the world, why God didn't just obliviate the world right then and start all over? 
I'm at the age now where I can look back and think of some things that I've said and even preached over the years that I just am so sorry I ever said them because I don't think they're right. I changed my view on some stuff and I've learned more. And I can remember a time when I said, God could have just zapped the world and blown it apart and ended everything right then and there. That's not true. Oh, God has the power to do that. But what I was thinking about was kind of like back in the days before computers and word processors, when you had to type your term papers on a typewriter. Any of you remember typewriters? clickety clackety loud things with annoying bells. And I can remember typing term papers on a typewriter, and I especially hated that when the professor required footnotes. It was so much easier when he said end notes were okay. But when footnotes, you had to count all the lines and do all of this measuring. And I would start typing, and I'd make a mistake. Out would come that correction fluid. Cover up the mistake. Go on. Make another mistake. Out would come the correction fluid. And after this, three or four times, I would rip that page out of the carriage, wad it up, and throw it in a trash can. By the time I got through with a term paper, my trash can was overflowing with pages that I had just crushed and thrown away. And for a long time, I thought, listen, God could have just wadded us up like a piece of paper and thrown us away. That is not true. God couldn't do that. You know why? Because he loves us. His love for his creation was greater than anything else. He could not destroy humanity whom he had created in his own image. No way. And so God demonstrated his love by sending his son. My dear friend, this morning, I want you to know God has demonstrated his love to you in so many ways. He has demonstrated his love by enabling you to see the azure blue of the sky. To feel the cool green grass under your feet. To experience a cool breeze blowing on a warm July day. To see the majestic mountains as they rise from the plain. Or to hear the ocean waves as they crash against the beach. God has allowed you to look into the starry skies to see the heavenly hosts of which he knows everyone by name. And above all, God has demonstrated his love for you by sending Jesus. You know, John is the only uh, writer in the Bible who uses the word that's found in both of these passages we looked at just a moment ago. In John 3, 16, where Jesus said, God loved the world, so loved the world, he sent his only begotten. And then in 1 John 4, verse 9, by this the love of God is manifested to us, he sent his only begotten. That phrase, only begotten, comes from the Greek word monogenes. John is the only biblical writer who uses it, the only gospel writer who uses it. It's a composition of two words, mono, meaning one, genes, meaning kind. Our word genealogy comes from genes, one of a kind. God sent a one of a kind, Jesus, his only begotten. That's what that means, his one of a kind son into the world. Why? Because he wanted to demonstrate to you that he loves you. And friend, pardon the expression, but if that doesn't get your spiritual fire burning, your wood is just wet. I told myself I wasn't going to preach this morning. I was just going to talk. Sorry. Number two. 
God's love is a devoted love. Look at that verse, 1 John 4, verse 10. (laughs) This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, there are two words, two phrases I want you to catch in there. Number one, we're going to go to the end of the verse. Send his son to be the, look at that word, propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. If you were here last Sunday, we talked about the justice and the wrath of God last Sunday. It's part of God's character. But we understood that God's justice and wrath are products of his love. But we also talked a little bit about that word, propitiation, which means the appeasement of wrath by means of a sacrifice. The appeasement of wrath by means of a sacrifice. Jesus was sent to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, back up and look at the first part of the verse here in 1 John 4, 10. When he says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. God doesn't love you because you came to church this morning. God does not love you because you brought your Bible today. God doesn't love you because you're such a good, outstanding, upright, moral person. God doesn't love you because you're a Bible class teacher, a preacher, an elder, a deacon, whatever. God doesn't love you for any of those things. God loves you for who he is. Not because of who you are, or me, who I am. We live in what I call a culture of contingency, where acceptance and approval is based upon achievement and accomplishment. That's our culture. If you want to be accepted or approved in our culture, you'd better accomplish something or achieve something so that others will approve, whether it's in the field of athletics being the all-time leading scorer or all-time leading rusher or all-time leading free throw shooter or home run hitter or whether it's in the field of arts or sciences, whether it's as an actor or an actress, whatever it may be, if you want to receive that acceptance and and, uh, uh, that uh, uh, sense of, uh, of being affirmed, then accomplishment and achievement. God looks at none of that because God doesn't love us based upon who we are. Rather, our love is based, look at this, John says, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And back up a couple of verses to verses 7 and 8 of 1 John 4 where he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is what? Love. You see, it's God's nature. It's God's character to love. And yet so often as Christians, we have felt this, um, th- this attitude of, well, I've just got to somehow earn God's grace. I've somehow got to earn God's love. I remember when I preached up in Newport back 25, 30 years ago now, uh, there was a sweet lady. She was a babysitter, one of the babysitters for our children we, um, we had a bunch of babysitters because after the first time, none of them ever wanted to do it again. But this lady was in her late 70s or 80s. And she was just the most faithful person you've ever seen in your life. I mean, she was one of these people, like some of you. She was there Bible class Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, never missed a beat. Just, I mean, all the time doing stuff for other people, taking food for people, a woman of good works, on and on and on I could go. And one night, she was the first one there at the church building, and I was there, and we were talking, um, and uh, we were talking about how wonderful heaven must be. And I'll never forget uh, this lady She said, I just hope that when it's my time to go, 
I've done enough good to get there. Oh, I wanted to say, no, that's not the way it works. It's not based upon the good that you do. Yes, you do good, but you do that good because you've been redeemed by Jesus. Because you've been set free from sin by him. But you don't earn anything. God, you don't earn God's love. God's love is devoted because of who he is. And then the third thing I want you to get this morning, please, as we start wrapping it up, but God's, God's love is distinctive. I mean, there has never been love like the love God has for you. Look, if you will, at one more passage this morning from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9 where Paul writes what I believe is really the Magna Carta of Christianity. Here in his love, uh, excuse me, Paul says, um, for while we were helpless, while we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Now who is that? Who is the ungodly? Would that include you and me? Yeah, probably. I think so, doesn't it? Christ died for the ungodly. For he says, scarcely for a good man would one die, though perhaps for a righteous man one would even dare to die. But look at verse 8. But God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did you catch that? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, having been justified by his faith, by, by uh, his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. What a passage. God's love is so distinctive. He has loved us even when we were not worthy of that love. I read the story recently of a preacher who stood to preach one Sunday morning, and in the audience there was an old man who was visiting the service that day. The preacher introduced the old man as being a longtime friend and said, this old man, this man has a story I, I'd like for him to share with you this morning. And he said, would you please, sir, come and share your story with us? And so the old man, with trembling hands and slow feet, rose and came to the pulpit. And when he got behind the pulpit, he began to tell the story of a ship that was caught in stormy seas off of the New England coast. On that ship, there were two boys about 10 or 12 years of age. One of the boys was the son of the captain. Suddenly, as they were aboard that ship in those stormy seas, a large wave swept across the deck and swept the two boys off their feet over the railing and into the treacherous waters. The captain immediately saw what had happened, and he reached for a life preserver, but there was only one life preserver. Who would he save? Who would he toss that life preserver to? His own son? Or his son's friend? He tossed the life preserver to his son's friend and pulled him to safety while his son died. And with tears streaming down his cheeks, the old man said, I was the captain. 
and your preacher was the boy to whom I threw the life preserver. Charles Wesley was so right. When he wrote 400 years ago, and can it be that I should gain an entrance in my, an interest in my Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain for me who death to him pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. The songwriter Bill Gaither was asked once, what is the most meaningful Christian hymn that you think has ever been written? And without batting an eye, Gaither said, the most meaningful Christian hymn, the love of God is greater far than pen or tongue of men can tell. It reaches past the farthest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down in care. God sent his son to win. His saving grace for Adam's race his erring child to reconcile and save from all his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the sky of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Will you sing the chorus with me? Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels. One more time, please. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall This morning, if you need to come and put Christ on in faith and repentance, baptism, if you need to come home, he stands to welcome you, and so do we while we stand and while we sing.